All right, guys, welcome to the Joe Danger Show. Bear with me, this is my first ever video interview, but I will be uploading this to my YouTube channel uh, in the near future and eventually to my podcast once that comes out. Today, I will be interviewing Mr. Skip Long, 83 years young. He is a true pioneer uh, in the spearfishing community, and I couldn't think of a better person to, to bring on for my number one episode. Uh, Skip and I first met. I don't know if you remember this, maybe two years ago in my inauguration of the Suncoast Seals Dive Club, which is the, one of the oldest dive clubs in the state of Florida. And it was founded in 1955 by yours truly, co-founded Mr. Skip Long. Um, and, you know, one thing about Skip, you always have a smile on your face. You're a leader in our dive club, but more importantly, to the dive community. Um, and I can't be... You know, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and doing this interview with me. And before we get started, I just want to give you a few personal stories. So, you know, I've only known Skip for two years here, but every time I'm at a meeting or I hear someone mention Skip, another crazy story comes up. So I got to hear these firsthand from, you know, teaching yourself how to scuba dive using Jacques Cousseau's book in 1955 to dragging magnets behind their boats, there's no GPS back then, to try to find shipwrecks, to, I don't know if this one's true, but using a, a protractor back in the day with the hard copy map to navigate, and someone put it upside down, and he ended up near Cuba, to, which this is my favorite story that I've heard the most, is the day after being cleared free of cancer, shooting a 60-pound cobia. So just 62 pounds. 62 pounds, heck yeah. So... <laughs> So anyway, just amazing stuff, and I couldn't be uh, more excited to do this this interview. Uh, but Skip, if you would, if you could just give us kind of a, a quick inter introduction. Hey, I, Joe, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, because I think the young people today need to understand that we have so many things, electronics today, that we did not have back in our day. You got to realize we didn't have GPS. The only thing we had was a compass and a depth finder later on. Right. But you're talking about pulling magnets behind the boat to find things. They weren't really magnets. What they were, they were lead, uh, uh, sort of like a bullet, and they put soap in the bottom of it, and we would throw it overboard and try to pick up a pearl on the bottom, and then we would know that's where to die. Interesting. Oh, and my first boat actually had a window in the bottom of it, and you'd lay there with a towel over your head and look at the bottom. And of course, you didn't get too deep, you couldn't. But, right. but anyway, to get back to how I got <laughs> yeah. into this, there's so many stories. Um, we, um, back in high school, um, I grew up here. My dad, I was a late in life child. My two sisters, one was 14 years older than I was, one was seven years older than I was, and they were sort of out of the house. And so my dad was a retired Marine officer. And so I was, he spent a lot of time with me and encouraged me to, first of all, into shooting with a 22 and a BB gun and all of that stuff. But, but I was very fortunate that he was able to spend time with me. So uh, I wasn't afraid to experience these things, struggle rifle team. So when I heard about that, and I said, this is cool. And I had this book called The Silent World by Jacques Cousteau. And it was told all these places around the world where he went. And um, I said, yeah, I really want to try that. I'd really think. And he went into a lot of detail about Boyle's Law. And so, but that's all we have. Right. There is no certification. In fact, there was no place to fill tanks in right. their water. So, and there was only steel tanks, and they were 72 cubic inch steel tanks. You had our, our round here hoses. Right. And uh, we would, uh, another pioneer, probably. Uh, he's gone now, but his name was Ray Oder. He was a great guy, and he he, he really started the diving in the area. Started a place where you could fill tanks over Tampa, but we had to go all the way over to Tampa and um, to and, get our and tanks. Now 
that as the Ray or Order Classic. Yeah, yeah. And sure. he's, a, he's a great guy. He was always willing to share his about diving with the young kids. But we started out in caves, diving in caves. And I found out the first, there was a cave over in Palm Harbor, and it was, um, it was, it was a, a sinkhole, actually. And when it, it came down at the top, you see the entrance was about as big as this room here. And when you went down, it was crystal clear. When you went down, it was shaped like a bottle. You go down, and about 50 foot, it went out like this. And there was caves that went off there. Now, we were high school. You know, so what are you, 16? So you're using a book to learn how to scuba dive, and then you're sending it in caves, right. which I know where that cave is. And I believe it's been totally shut down now. Oh, yeah, it's been, been shut down some, for years. Some serious accidents. Yeah. yeah, serious accidents. I went down in that cave, though, with this terrible equipment, uh, 155 foot. <laughs> as, and, a, as a 16 year old. Yeah. And and it was, it was eerie when you got down to the bottom. It came up like this, and there was this tree, and it, was, it looked like hands. Wanting to pull you down, down inside, and but we didn't know anything about cave diving and how far you go. But anyway, you talk about uh, dangerous. Oh yeah, we I can remember going up into one of these caves off the lateral like this, and I thought oh, this is so cool, it's so clear. Wow, what I did not realize was that I was stirring up the bottom. And I turned around and looked at, uh, we didn't even have gauges. The, the, um, we have five minutes of air. It wasn't a pony cage. It was, we just, you just clicked it when you ran out. And I had clicked that and I turned around to come out and it's, I can't see. I can't see anything. And one of the things that the stove said in his book was, don't panic. Don't panic. And to this day, I remember I grabbed this piece of limestone coming out of the cave and grabbed hold of it like that and said, don't panic. Don't panic. We had lights. None of the lights like we have today that are so beautiful. We made them out of steel beams uh, and put them in a funnel aluminum funnel right. and we made an aluminum piece come down like a handle and then it went to one of those six volt batteries, square batteries that were let you could all use them one time. <laughs> and I, we I had this thing and I said, wait a second, I'm going to settle down. And I started going at the top of the cave like this. And when I got from about here to the wall there, I see my buddy, and we were, we were probably 60 foot. And at that time, I was going, <laughs> run out of air. Yeah. And um, I made a free descent. I lived through it, but I I didn't go, well, I did some cave diving after that, but then we started using ropes and we started trying to find out a little bit. But I dove most of the caves off the of Swanee River. Okay. All, all of them. Uh, the springs that run into Swanee River, all of them have paid them. Did your buddy make it out okay? Yeah, he was fine. He so, was so Skip's in. intro, he's 16 years old, cave diving. I don't do that anymore. 1955 yeah. equipment. Knowledge is from a book and homemade lights. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. And uh, now, how I got into spearfishing, I said, this is, this is really dangerous. And I told my dad about it. I don't think I want you doing that anymore. And he said, but you've always hunted. You probably like spearfishing. So um, I was out with my buddy. His name is Jody Wolf. We went to high school together. at the same class and everything. And he was the first president of the Sun Coast City. Ah. And so he had a brother that was about two years older than us. And he 
we went to diving with us also. And I said, when I get to the bottom, what do I, I do? He said, well, first of all, you got to get to the bottom. Boom. <laughs> I'm down there with this little bitty spear gun like this. It was, and it was, it was, water was dirty as heck. But it was sort of cool. Was I this mean, here in Tampa? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was right. It was uh, a ball clear water. Okay. And, uh, and the boats we had back then, you know, 25 horsepower outboard on it, you know. But the water was clear and the fish were all over the place. Anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, so, so that was, so that was scuba. When did you start free diving, or, or were you doing both at the same time? We were really doing both. Really, when I got into really free diving the most is um, we. Our first club was named the Clearwater Reef Riders. About when I was graduating from high school, which was 1959. Um, that year, there was another club called the Sperry Seal, and you've heard of electronic company called Sperry Ram. They called Sperry Ram. I, I haven't actually. Yeah, but they had within their company, they had a dive club, and it was sort of dwindling away. And so this fellow, Art Baldwin, um, he uh, uh, we merged the club and called it the Suncoast Seal. Awesome. And, and he had a little boat, a 25 foot, and we would go up off of Bayport. You know where Bayport is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and back then, there were these bird racks out there, and they were just like a tabletop, sort of, and they might be you know, 10 by 10, or, and so the birds could land on there and nest and things like that. And what you would do, as I said, no GPS, right? You use the compass board and a stoplight. Oh, and you would run this course, and I'll never, re I'll never forget this one rock that we like to go and, and the grouper were big, you know, oh, they were in that. In, that was the best place because there was all these things up there. And that, and that area still is yeah, pretty good. For yeah, people. I dive up there. I love that yeah. up there. Anyway, he would run the that course and hopefully you would hit it. Now, you, you got to realize back then the water was even clearer than it is now. And you would, you would see the shadow there. You would from there, you went to another spot, you know, but you would have to run that, that compass board. And you can miss it by, you know, 20 feet. And then you got to say, wait a lost. second, you click, click, I got to go back. I, can't. I mean, it, it was crazy. Yeah. So, uh, but that was all free diving. And he was a big free diver. And uh, so I really got into free diving. And I really love free diving. Oh yeah, uh, there's there's nothing like it. Yeah, I'd much rather free dive than dive with a tank. That was that was one heck of an intro. What is the craziest story you have on the water? I know you probably have hundreds, but what's what's the most memorable story? Remember, I talked about my buddy that was uh, I went to Jody Wolf. He was the first president, and he was a uh, attorney. Now we were older; we were out of college. He was a tax attorney, and you know he was doing pretty good. And Jody was he was at the the meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah so I was at Jody. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, yeah. And and um, he had bought this. Uh, guys were just getting into bigger boats, and he bought this racer, this uh, ocean racer, and. Had two engines in it inboard. Okay. And we said, we're going to Case All Bay in the Bahamas. Okay. So we had two other guys with us. And we run out of Marathon, run down to the Case All Bay, 60 miles across uh, the Gulf Stream. Okay. No GPS. We did have a radio. And 
we did have a race. <laughs> That's all. <Yeah. laughs> so did you go from Tampa to Marathon, or is the boat already in Marathon? It's not either. It's funny as hell, but I'll tell you about that if you want to hear about it. But anyway, he had, he had made a trailer for the thing. This uh, thing was was uh, 32 foot long and heavy, heavy though. They were back then the ocean races. They made them out of fiberglass. It was this thick, right? <laughs> and so he made the special trailer for it. And we hauled it down to uh, Everglades City. Okay. Put it in, ran across uh, Tampa, uh, uh, Florida Bay. Right. Went out a marathon and across to the Case All Bay. Okay. Shot, shot the 16 uh, pound um, hog nose snapper down there. Oh, yeah. Down there. But we had all kinds of That's breweries. a monster. Yeah. We, we, we got. Group or everything. I mean, it was wonderful. And we were sort of living on the boat. It was sort of, um, um, it was rough. It was Spartan because there was no beds in it. And we were just hanging on the back. I mean, we were sleeping on the back of the boat. And the boat wasn't really complete. So uh, we had another guy with us, two other guys. And we're coming back across the Gulf Stream. We we had 600 gallons of gasoline. I have, I have, yeah. Mm -hmm. We run out of, of gas out in the Gulf Street. Oh, no. And, but we had been, we had been running all around and everything, but we thought, and there was, but there was no place to get, well, so, but it can't call yeah. The case all banks have no, nobody's living there. Yeah. And so, we we get to uh, out in the Gulf Stream, run out of gas, and but back then you could call the Coast Guard and they would come and get you. And we did have a radio, and we called and finally, what we were really worried about it wasn't like it was real rough or anything, but we we're afraid a freighter would run over us. Right, you know they don't just stop. Yeah, and uh, in fact we had several come by that were. You know, we got the waves and everything from them. But, uh, and finally, about two o'clock in the morning, we see this the Coast Guard coming. So back. this is at night. This is at night. So you're they, drifting. I hope you have maybe some lights on the boat. But, and how far are you from the coast of Florida? Um, we're about, uh, uh, we must be 12 miles, maybe. So about we could see. See, we didn't know where we were. We didn't know if we were off a marathon or where, but that light, sombrero light, we could see just blinking a little bit. And we were trying to, we had charts, you know, and we could tell that by the way that it's blinking, then that, that's the way the Coast Guard found us. Yeah. And so this is the funny part of the story. Okay. Okay. So the Coast Guard comes, they pull us into Marathon, uh, and he said, and this is your protractor deal. Okay. Uh, they pull us in, and we get a citation because we didn't have enough life reserves. But we got gas, and we said, we're headed across um, Florida Bay, and it is black column. And one of the guys, and that was with us, Dale Warren. Okay. And uh, it was his birthday. Uh -huh. And so we, did, I said, we got to have a drink for your birthday. Dang right. And so what we're doing, we're setting a course for uh, Everglades City. <laughs> so we started playing this game called Buzz Bang. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't. On fives and multiple of fives, you go along and you'll say one, two, three, four, bang. Six, seven, eight, nine, bang. Ten, eleven. So, and if you miss, you have to take a swig. We played this game for about an hour. Uh, and supposedly we're on a 
trip, you know, back to Everglades. Dude, City. Yeah, you're going to the North Carolina. Oh, let's. Joey said, where are we? We're we supposed to hit a marker. I said, oh, where are we going? Anyway, he said, I don't think this if we can't be land. You know, we're out in the middle of no place, all this rock. And he said, where, where, where do you think we're going to go? I said, no, there's nobody. Um, put the map on the, I said, the way to do this, put the map on the floor here. And each one of us, we argued about this. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we argued about it. And each one will take the protractor and figure out where he thinks that we are. And then we'll draw to the point, And that's where we probably are. Right. So it was funny. I can't believe it. So everybody's down there. They have their turn down there working uh, help things and, and Jody is one of these guys he says I know exactly what you know. so he puts his thought down and he, right? he's a lawyer right he's the lawyer yeah, he's a and, and, and <laughs> uh, he's a good guy though, okay. let me tell you and um um <laughs> he's a gator is the only bad thing oh, and I, I'm yeah. so uh, I we don't like gators <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Uh, good guy. anyway <laughs> So I go here, he goes there, uh, Dale goes here, the other guy goes goes here. We zoom, 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 right there where we are. So we uh, uh, go, said, okay, that's what we agreed on. Stand, if we didn't, we went for about a half an hour, no, 40, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to dance, we didn't hit the marker. Wow. Good old Jody. <laughs> then we get into Everglades City. It's a little tiny place, but you go up this big, long canal. And um, we get up there, and the highway patrol is there waiting for us. And they say, you were going too fast down this uh, uh, canal. You were throwing boats up on the side. And Jody said, well, I, you know, he said, oh, he said, let me take care of this. And so he goes up there and talks to the, the highway patrol. And finally, he, the guy lets us go. And this trailer, um, as I say, it was a coal made or special made trailer right. for this boat. And in fact, you had to put wooden ramps up under it so that you could go back it wouldn't be so much in the water and you could find now remember this inboard boat too right and this back then there was no i-75 you went 41 down along there and it was only a two-lane road in a lot of places yeah and we were pulling that big boat that big heavy boat with a um carry all heavy pretty heavy duty but the problem with that big trailer was that it would weave back and forth if you got over 50 and so they said who's going to drive so the birthday boy uh dale warren he said i'll i'll drive i'm fine so we're going down 41, and he gets that thing going a little too fast, and it starts whipping like this, and a, a big semi comes back, whips it off the road like this, comes back here, back here, and takes the, the um, vehicle, brings it back in here, and the boat comes off of the trailer. Oh, well, it just crushed the trailer. Oh, and it, it's in the middle of the road. <laughs> and we got traffic held up oh, miles. No. Nobody can get around. Because <laughs> oh, no. there's uh, where we went, there was a canal on each side of the road. So there's no going around. No going around. And guess who was the first one there? The cop. The cop. <laughs> yeah. Before we knew it, there was cops all over the place. <laughs> it's funny as hell. I... <laughs> We got out of the thing and we had our spear guns in this rack where they're set up. They had come out, we hit so hard, the spear guns went out like this and stuck. They were stuck. The whole spear gun. 
just sticking up like this. We had lobster, we had uh, fish, everything rose, and it was all inside the boat. It was, it was awful. Well, and, that's one heck of a story. I think the moral of the story is, well, a couple, a couple morals there, but. <laughs> We take a lot for granted nowadays yeah. where, you know, we get in a boat, press autopilot, and 30 minutes later, we're exactly on yeah. the spot we dove a week ago, and the, it's the same exact bottom, same yeah. fish. Yeah. But that, that's... Uh, and, and the equipment is so much better now, the way they build yeah. boats, and, and uh, electronic equipment is so much better. Yeah. And um, But anyway, that's one of the funny, most memorable... Uh, I have a few more. So, man, I have so many questions for you, Skip. So, let's go back to the 1950s, 1960s. You already mentioned the water was a lot clearer. Were there a lot more fish, and uh, were they bigger? Bigger, many more fish, many more fish. Yeah. But you did not have a season for fish or anything. I mean, you could go out diving. You could, you know, anything you saw, you could shoot. Right. Including the Goliath River. Yeah. And... Um, uh, it was just, it was just beautiful. Of course, the Keys was still the place to go to. Right. Where you're putting on the Southern Open. Well, back then, that was the big dive. And, and FSDA, Florida Skin Diving Association, it was really a statewide organization. Wow. And so we had it in the Keys, Saturday and Sunday. And they accumulated the uh, points, and but most people stayed down there for a whole week, and just got fish, had a good time, and um, it was just a you know great time. Yeah. And in a lot of my experience, I was in high school, and we couldn't afford to stay. It was called it's a brown thing. It's called Salty Dog. Okay. And it was these little cottages that were on the water. We stayed in an RV park up the road. We put up a tent. And, you know, we went down as, you know, just a bunch of high school kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had a great time. But the guys that were older than us, uh, they'd take us under their wing and they'd tell us how to free diving, how to shoot. It was just great. Though. That's amazing. Yeah, I still love diving in the Florida Keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's beautiful down yeah. there. Um, I gotta tell you about buying a cannon down there. So yeah, yeah, no, let's hear it. Okay. So I don't know if you know ahead. this, Skip. I love history, okay. and if I could do anything in life, I don't know, maybe being a treasure hunter, that would yeah. be that would be amazing. But so, what was this like a an ancient 1600, 1700 cannon? We were. Uh, diving down there is probably the week, one of the week when we were down there for the uh, Southern Open the following week. And we had one of our friends, um, Gene Smith, was his name. He, his dad actually lived down there. And so he let his son use the boat, which probably wasn't <laughs> such a good idea. Yeah. And, and it was an inboard, had a little cabin on it. It was about, I think, 25 bucks. And, um, but that was really nice. We were used to diving out of, you know, 16 foot with a 25 on it. Yeah. And uh, we were uh, diving off a place called uh, Coffin's Patch. And he said, I'm down there, I'm looking around, we have tanks on. I'm looking around and I see this log down there. And I said, This is this is cool. What the hell this thing got down here? And so I went around to the front of it and I see a hole. And I go around the other end and I find this knob on there. That's and so it's cool. completely encrusted. There's this all this ballast water water rock down there. And I bet you there's, there's gold. There's gold. Yeah, there's gold there. So fortune. Now remember, no GPS. We don't know 
exactly, you know, where this is. Tie a rope to it. So we tied a rope to yep. it and a coconut. Oh, not the coconut here. <laughs> yeah. How deep, how deep in water were you? Oh, we probably 45 foot, okay. 30 foot maybe. And <laughs> so we go back and, uh, as I say, we're in a, uh, a RV park where we're camping. And we go back and we go around to all the, um, uh, service stations, and we get uh, interviews, and we knew we couldn't, you know, lift it up. So we get all these interviews, go back out the next day, and after looking for an hour, we found the dark coconut float. And the line is cut. No, still down. So we we go down on it, and we tie these inner tubes. You know, all around it, and took an extra tank down, blew up the inner tubes, and nothing happened. We thought it was a Of course, it had coral all over it. And um, so we went down and kept working, and where it finally broke, it broke it loose, and then got up in the boat and pulled lines up, and we started pulling it up. It made it easier to pull it up with the air tubes on there. But of course, we couldn't lift it. The thing was probably longer than this couch yeah. right there. And so we just whipped it off, you know, and said, we just go in real slow. And if we didn't run into a storm. Oh. <laughs> and the boat's going this way, that way, and these lines, we had, we had to tie the lines up to the front of the boat and it went through the cabin and and Gina said, My dad to me, this is rubbing on his boat, you know, and blah, blah, blah. finally we get they wanted to cut it loose. I said, No, 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 this thing we're millions, you know, we gotta we we got to got to take it in. We'll sell it for you. We get in finally to uh the the R V park had a dock. Yeah, but we couldn't get it up on the dock. So we got a, a car wrecker to come, and he lifted it up off the dock, and we rented a trailer. We put it in, and we <laughs> drove it uh, all the way back to Turbo from Marathon. Wow. And it was a, one of these other deals, these deals where you know we didn't load it right, and the trailer would start doing like this. But then we started trying to sell it. And we went every place, restaurants, uh, uh, museums. I wonder where it'll steal. They said, oh, if it was grass, we would like that. But this is, this is the deal. That's too funny. Hey, well, the moral of the story on that one is you got the dang cannon. You we got, the, we, <laughs> we got the cannon, and guess what happened to it? Look, what happened? <laughs> the, remember I said, Gene, the guy, his dad lived there. We had tied up and that rent in the trailer and all this stuff. I think it was sixteen five dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot, but back yeah, then yeah, that, that was, was and we were just high school kids. Uh, <laughs> he he said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll pay you sixty five bucks for it. He came up, got it, and and uh took it all the way back to the TV and had it mounted out in front of his house. That's cool. How, did you find out how old the cannon was? No, there was no way really to to, yeah. to do that. I've got it over I've got the cannonball and one or cannon. We'll have to there. we'll have to go take a look at that. Yeah, we'll yeah. get a video of that. Yeah. Um man, I would if I found it I'd be so interested to go back and see if you could find any of the wreckage or well, there were other cannons. Yeah, we tried to do that a yeah. number of times. We could never find the place. But as I say, there was no way to do it. Hey, Skip, we're gonna go through your logbook and <laughs> we're gonna go find the we'll, we'll go find it. <laughs> okay. Uh have you ever found anything else cool like that while you're diving? Uh you know, that's something we always talk about, especially yeah. in the Bahamas. We're like, oh what what would yeah. we do if we came across the ship? Yeah, not really because yeah. You know, even though I was spear fishing after them, 
usually I am spearfishing so darn hard. I mean, really, if you don't just fall yeah. into it, you don't see it. Yeah. Um, well, I have a, another question here on sharks. You know, nowadays that's a big, uh, it's a controversial topic, in my opinion. You know, I haven't been diving as long as you used to, not nearly, maybe 10 years. And it seems 10 years ago, it was kind of like a big deal. Oh, wow, look, there's a big bull shark. You know, you, you maybe see one a day. Now, you go to a shipwreck, especially really anywhere in Florida. I mean, Bahamas are just totally out of control. But, but you know, if you go 30 miles off of Clearwater, I hit a shipwreck. And the second I'm in the water, I'm looking at five bull sharks coming up at me. Yeah. Um, I, I've been in the water where we've seen a great white. Just it, the populations are just, in my opinion, out of control in the 60s. And, you know, just have you noticed a change in the in the yeah, of sharks? There, there seems to be a lot more sharks. And um, a lot of sharks, you know, are on the endangered species list that you can't shoot them. And um, the worst, my worst experience was in, in the Bahamas. And um, it was, I was down the Palmas, and we were um, diving. Later on, by the way, my friend Joey, he bought a bigger boat, a 65 footer. Had a boy. And we would fly over there. Now, I was working then, had little money, and so, uh, uh, and I was in sales, and I owned my company. And so we'd go over there for a week at a time, keep the boat there, treasure uh, key, and um, we just fly back and forth. And, and normally in the summertime is the best time to do it. And but those big boats, one of the problems with them is that you know they're not real maneuverable, so you can't dive directly from that. You have to have smaller boat and maybe four of us we we have two um smaller boats like mm -hmm. 14 foot right that we could bring aboard and the little outboard you yep. know. and we would maybe venture five miles from where we anchored the big boat and we were free diving down and that's what they got like about the Bahamas we were always free diving and um, and you can't use spear gun, but back then you could use spear gun. Okay. I don't know if you could really use spear gun. But, but no one was really bad. And nobody. And, and water's just crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, love it. And um, and you use you're using free shafts, uh, slings, you know. And um, I was um, I had a. A really nice hog nose snapper came around with it was about 20 foot of water. And I got him, I shot him, and he ran up into a hole under the uh, ledge. And so I was trying to get it out, trying to get it out. And I go up and know and Jody was my death partner. He said, Come on, you can't believe it. I said, I'm not believing this. this. So I dove down and I was in there trying to pull it out, trying to clear it out, and I felt something on my leg. I thought it was Jody just tugging on me to get me to come out. And I turn around and the biggest reef shark I've ever seen. Uh, and it, I thought my leg was in his mouth. <laughs> but he was, his nose was up on my leg. So I thought my foot was in his mouth, but you know, he was trying to dip the fish too. Yeah, that's always my biggest fear. I think that's when you're most vulnerable as a free diver. You know, even out here, you shoot a big guy, yeah. he goes under a ledge, and now, you know, it's like the dinner bell's ringing for these sharks. And then someone, your dive buddy, has to go down there and stick his head up the ledge five feet and pull the sucker out. Yeah. Yeah, and I've had it where you look to your right, and you know, one time it happened to me, there's like a, a nine foot lemon shark. I'm like, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and I think that's how a lot of people get bit. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget, I was, you know, my dad buddies, my good dad buddies, I come up and all of them are headed for the boat. They're like, like walking on the water to get to the boat. You know, here I am, 
They're like, Skip, how about me? Skip's been how about eaten. Me? <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave them behind. Yeah. Uh, were there, so overall, were there um, as many sharks as now? Oh, or is it, I, mean, I, I think in the Bahamas, I yeah. think it's worse now, though. Yeah. I really do because, you know, they're feeding them and all kind of stuff. They think that, that you know, you're going to feed them now. They're, they're associating they humans with food and I'm totally against uh, yeah. shark feeding. Yeah. Um, but interesting. Yeah. And I'm all for conservation and, and preserving sharks, but I just think there's a big imbalance when. You know, everyone's shooting red snapper, gag grouper, all these reef fish, but yet no one's shooting Goliath grouper or sharks. So it's just, it doesn't seem right to me. Yeah. But, uh, but up until 1990, I believe you were able to spear Goliath grouper. So what's the, and you already mentioned, you know, you speared Goliath before. So what is the biggest Goliath grouper you ever got in a boat? Uh, 300 pounds. 300 pounder. And he was, uh, off of Fairwater. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, it was another guy and myself. Um, he was from um, a good buddy of mine. He was from Virginia. Okay. And um, he came down to visit me. So he got there down. And we had there for dinner before. And uh, I said, I'm going to take you out to see an artificial reef off of Clearwater. And they were, it was like a Box, these boxes, they were uh, probably that wide yeah. and twice that long. Okay. And they had circular holes in them for the fish to go up in them. And they made those out of concrete. Right. And um, so I said, now listen, do not shoot, shoot. We call them juicy. Yeah, but uh, do not shoot a jewfish, but you could. Right. Um, it said, do not shoot a jewfish. <laughs> He's going to take your equipment. And gonna, you know, we had to go on. And he went down. The first thing he shot was down in this hole, and he shot the thing right in the back. <laughs> not where you want to see it. <laughs> So the hole was about this big. So he couldn't push the spear this way and get his head up, and he couldn't push him this way and get his tail up. And he said, What am I gonna do? I said, I think we are gonna cut the line. Is there anything we can do? And he said, I don't want to cut the line. I said, Okay, I'll go around to the front of this box and I'll be able to look up in there. And I'll be able to maybe grab him by the gills and you push the spear <laughs> up yeah. so maybe I can pull <laughs> him out. out. Yeah. And I'll never forget. I, I had these cloth gloves on. I and, and we had been jerking him around so he's mad. Very mad. So I stick my hands up in there to go for his gills and the damn thing bit me. Oh, yeah. Both hands. Oh, yeah. And I can't. I'm there. And he, the hole's right here. He puts his barnacles all over. He's shaking his head like a bulldog. <laughs> I'm sure I'm he got scratches all over me and everything. And I said, I'm going to get my hands out of here. So finally, he got my hands hands out. And the funniest sight, he's in there going, like, he's still got my gloves. <laughs> So anyway, I go back up to the boat and I said, I think you're going to be able to let me in. So, you're you're going to handle some business. Yeah. So I went down and shot him, pulled him out. But that was, uh, I think that one was only, uh, I guess he was 300 pounds. It's a lot of meat. Yeah. Yeah. And back then, um, now this was after high school, but we had got him before and we would fillet them out with meat tenderizer on and sell them to the restaurants. Yeah, right. Yeah. We call them a grouper. <laughs> it, it, it is grouper. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, this kind of leads us into another question I had. So, you know, I know diving in general is inherently it's a risky, risky sport, um, but there's ways to you know, mitigate your risk, of course. 
Do you, what's your, do you have any safety advice that I can take home with me and for those listening? I think the main thing is, first of all, take care of your equipment. Yeah. Second is that you need to die with a buddy. And even though, and it's one of the problems with um, spearfishing is that normally, you know, you may not have your buddy right there. This is one fish this way, this way. With, with free diving, you're a little different because you guys have, uh, you know, you're waiting for them to come up with your smart, smart, smart. One smart. up, one down. And that, yeah. that's the number one rule of free diving. It's always diving with a buddy. Yeah. Yep. And, and even with scuba, what we do normally is we don't anchor the boat. We, uh, and it's usually two down, two up. And if you come up, there's usually a boat there. Because you don't have to call off the anchor, you don't have to do anything. But I think one of the biggest dangers of spear fishing is other boats. Yeah. I can tell you a story about it. If you want yeah, I know what's there. Yeah. 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 We're diving, free diving up there off of Bayport. It's uh, shallow, 15 to 20 foot water. Sure. Four of them. And we're in my friend Jupiter. We're all free diving. And it was so calm and it was so bright out. And there's no, so we didn't have anybody in the boat. Everybody wants to free dive, but we're, we've anchored the boat up and we're just free diving. Around the boat, mm-hmm. we're on a ledge, and um, we have all the electronic equipment, GPS, you know everything. So this is more recent. Oh yeah, yeah. This was about five years ago, okay. and all at once I hear <laughs> before I knew it, a boat comes. I could see the prop, and. I looked up and crashed over the top of this. He had just gotten the boat. Over the top, ripped the, the, the top up and touched the, um, anchor line. Oh my goodness. And at the time, uh, Mike Ryan was here. Okay. He was just getting into the boat. And he saw it coming, and he's like, "Yeah, hey, 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 watch out, watch out!" Watch. And and it just goes over the top, and the boat's drifting away. And David said, "Skip, stay with the anchor line." And he starts swimming after he and Oscar start swimming after the thing. And I looked up, and I'm cussing the boat, and it looked like somebody had taken a shark and come along and out of the bow mm-hmm. and just cut the whole front of that thing out. Yeah. Did and the other boat keep going? He came around and said, are y'all all right? And we said, uh, hell no, we're not all right. I mean, you tore the hell out of our boat. What's your name? What's your name? And he took off. And we finally, we called Coast Guard, called Marine Patrol. And they actually caught him, Good. and he didn't have any insurance, and it did over thirty thousand dollars damage, thirty six thousand, I think it was, to the boat. But worse, he could have just missed us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I could have killed, killed, killed multiple people. Yeah. I know scalloping up in Homosassa in that area. I think recently someone was hit by a, you know, similar. Similar thing, someone's not paying attention. I've almost been hit by a boat scalloping up there. I remember being on the ground, hearing the engine, and just holding on the bottom and watch those the prop went right over me. It's terrifying. It's it's really scary. And one of the things that Florida is doing now for these younger kids and all, you have to take a safety course. And I think it's a good idea. One of my uh, grandsons um, just took it at 14, you know. Yeah. And I think it really is a good idea, even though he's been around boats all his life. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I think it's the boats are a scarier situation than 
charts and you yep. know I have grouper and yep. you know a lot of people ask me am I afraid of sharks when I'm free diving? Well, yeah, honestly, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about them. Yeah. But my biggest concern, number one, is shallow water blackout, and number two is honestly a spear gun. Someone turns a spear gun and the trigger goes off, or they hand you a gun and it goes off. And probably number three is, is other boats. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think some things you can do are just make sure you have a big dive flag in your boat, and then maybe even one of those floating dive flags above you. And then, but, but then it also goes back to have a buddy yeah. uh, who's looking out. So if yeah. he sees a boat coming, he could, you yeah. know, make some noise. Yeah. And, and that's one reason that we, you know, we two in, two out. Uh, in the boat, because if you see somebody coming, you can run the boat around, around, and, and guard your divers. Yeah. And uh, I think that's very important. And you talk about buddies, it's not only the buddy that you got down below, it's the buddies up in the boat, yeah. which have probably more say what's going on than anything. Yeah, I think just when you're out diving, everyone, whether you're in the water, in the boat, you need to be paying attention. You need to be thinking of the other guys in the water or girls in the water. Um, another thing, you know, all this technology is great. A lot of times I go out, we have the spot lock. So we can just check the spot, turn on the spot lock, hop down. If it's good, maybe we start to enter, maybe we just keep the spot lock on. But I had a buddy coming up, a uh, 60, 70 foot dive, and he's coming up, and sure enough, he's going, I mean, making. Could not make a straighter line to smashing his head on the spinning prop. Oh, we're wow. like, and one of the other guys swam in, grabbed my buddy, and pushed him. I mean, he missed hitting it by inches. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know what it would have done. Probably would have cut him up pretty good, I'd imagine. Um, all right. I got I got a, a couple more questions for you, Skip. So you mentioned nationals. Where were where were those? Okay. Well, they have them. What we do in the state of Florida is we have a qualification. You've got to qualify for it. And so we take divers from the, all the, from the state and we have a tournament for those divers. And it, the team is made up of three divers. We're all three divers. No students. We used to have it up off a board. And I and the top three teams. So we, we got Sunday Sea, we got you know the you know what is it? Box would yeah. would be there, but with Miami, they come from Miami too. Over sometimes to qualify on our side, yeah. side which would upset us because a lot of good divers over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but. Then they would go to wherever nationals is. So up to, we had one in the Keys, that was a great one. One here recently. They go to California, has them. They have them up the East Coast for nationals. But, um, you know, in 19, so I go in um, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. Actually, you talk about good divers. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Hawaiians, oh, they're yeah. diving against you. Yeah. This is a funny story. Let's hear it. Um, 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 this is 1999. It was in the Keys, and we were pretty hot then. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So we had been driving, diving against some of the guys in Miami pretty hard you know, before. So I knew a lot of them. And they were all good guys. A lot of them Cubans, yeah, and probably diving all their, you know, oh, yeah, you know, starting off. A lot of really good Cuban free divers. Yeah. So um, we're having a uh, captain's meeting. And I see Jose there and they say, hey, I hear this Hawaiian is pretty good. So let me tell you, Skip, you know that wreck out there in 100 foot of water where we practice on going, going down on? And I was at 100 foot diver, like, you know, back then maybe I could work 60 pretty good. Yeah. And, but, but the Miami.
dynamic guys, a lot of them work out with him. Yeah. And so he said, I went down, there's a boat over there, boat over there, we're all just sort of diving down. I go down and I see this guy laying on the bottom. And I said, oh crap, got he's, a water block. He's out. dead. <laughs> he's laying right there. He said, I've come down. He said, I figured I'd grab his fin and pull him up at least. And he said, he's laying there just like that. And uh, I get down to him, almost down to him, and he must have felt that I was down there. And then I see him look at his watch, and then I see him look at me, and he goes like this. <laughs> he goes, alive. <laughs> he said, yeah, I lost it. <laughs> I lost it. By the way, the Hawaiian, he was Hawaiian, yeah. little old Hawaiian guy. They did. They beat our yeah. pants that year. Emily and I, we did our, our honeymoon in, in Hawaii. Oh, wow. And believe it or not, on the last day, I got to go out with a local big wave surfer, Tyler Luronde, a great guy, yeah. amazing surfer, also an amazing free diver. We took his jet ski out, and we looked for Wahoo, Marlin, Mahi, you know, the way things chum. And it, wow. after, I remember he's like, yeah, you know, this is a really good spot to see tiger sharks. Like, ah, great. <laughs> and then we went to a reef. And it was crystal clear. And he goes, yeah, you're going to have to shoot these fish at 80 to 90. I'm like, what? So I pulled the trigger three times, all between 80 to 90 feet. Yeah. And these fish are, they're, you know, this big. And I miss all three times. <laughs> it's like the fish, they see you, and then they're at 60 feet, then they go to uh, 70, and then uh, you can never close the gap. But yeah, that's, that's one of those amazing dives. They have to dive deep to get yeah. fish out there. Oh, wow. Um, so w where is your, if you could pick one spot, the free dive spearfish, where are you going? Bahamas. Bahamas, yeah. Yeah, I love the Bahamas. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm going to get over there one more time before I, I, I go to Diver's Heaven. No, yeah, you yeah. Go. We'll, we'll get you out there a couple of times. <laughs> but uh, um, I've just done a lot of it, especially when my buddy had his 65 footer. We'd be on there for. You know, a week we wouldn't see anybody for a week. They were just wonderful. Yeah. Just, and and you know, we just it was plenty of fish. We didn't take any food other than what we shot and what we yeah. along with the the food. So yeah. Emily and I we were there last year and she shot her first fish on full gear. No a nice hog snapper as as you call them. Um awesome. Well, I've got I've got one more question. For you, Skip. So, actually, I have two more questions. Okay. Advice: If you could give any advice to younger generations, what would it be? Uh, get certified from a good certification facility. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the greatest experience that you can have. I've been doing it for sixty years. And it's, I can't put it into words. It's just, uh, but I want to share that. It's just so beautiful. Yeah. And, and the people that you meet in diving, because a lot of times they have your life in your hands and you got to trust them, you know. Oh, yeah. But most of them are the greatest people that you ever meet by. Yeah. And being able to share, share those experiences. Oh, yeah. you know, that, it's stuff you'll never forget. Yeah. And I think, especially with free diving, when you're down there at 60 feet and you just have no, you know, the urge to breathe, you're just relaxing, yeah. you're just in the moment. It's almost like a deep meditation. And then it's, it's impossible to explain to anyone unless yeah. they've done it. It's something I know I, I, can, I can't go without. I'm always against free diving. Well, and, and you know, it's, you don't have to spear fish. Yeah. You know I mean, just not knowing what you're going to see next. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's always an adventure. Yeah. Uh, I think, and I would. So after all these years, you kind of answered the question, but, but what keeps you going back out there? The memories, the friends. All of that, my problem is you can't stay in shape. Yeah. Stay in shape. And, um, you just can't dive 
this weekend and die a month later. Mm -hmm. You've got to stay in shape all the time. And mm -hmm. that's what's hurting me, you know, so I'm like I'm 83 years old, but if I hadn't run and biked and all that stuff, I wouldn't be able to experience that. And it's the thing I, I, I can't agree with, with Skip more. Um, I've shown up to trips where after, I like to hunt myself, so it's, you know, after I've been duck hunting and I haven't been running, I've been up where it's cold, and then I go to a dive trip and I'm very my breath. But, but yeah, that's what it motivates me to stay in shape, eat healthy, yeah. you know, I haven't drank in 40 something days, and uh, maybe we'll have a beer after yeah. that, yeah. special occasion. <laughs> But yeah, I do that. One, because I want to be healthy, but two, so I can enjoy my time in the water. Yeah. Well, Skip, I got you a little gift. Oh, so you, you, you guys that. will see uh, in the video, Skip is a big artist. He loves art. And this is this was done by a dear friend of mine this past summer. It was a 45-pound African pompano I shot. Uh -huh. And we did two prints. And it's called Gai Gaiutaku, I believe. It's, it's Japanese traditional art. And my print is framed in my office and this was the second print which i had laying around and i thought it would be a perfect gift for skip let's see oh wow isn't that Another cool way. wow let's oh it around real quick. wow is it is it the wrong side it's this way oh i think it's how do we ah oh, oh, there we go oh. let's put it oh wow that is wonderful yeah, it's Wonderful. how many pounds you think? Forty-five. Forty-five. How yeah. nice! Thank so, you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, Skip. I appreciate your time. <laughs> hey, we'll, uh, anytime, anytime. Here. I don't know where where I'm going to be able to put it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hang it up somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah.